Okay, it is time for the official presentation of the candy to the person who replied first to the email. No, not replied first. It was me, okay, so Nancy. Not to mess with the timestamp, it was totally me. Oh, yeah, Yasser's at Ramadan. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay. okay. Just take okay, a candy and have Get one. something for Rachel, and then you, you can, you can, you know, I owe you one. There you go. All right. Twix is an excellent choice. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's time to talk about the principle of superposition. means what? What's the principle of superposition say? Basically, yeah, the electric field of a bunch of charges is obtained by adding up the electric field of all the individual charges that they were acting alone. That's really what it comes down to is electric fields, for that matter, magnetic fields are additive. The, the electric and magnetic fields due to a collection of sources is just, just the sum of the electric and magnetic fields that would be due to each of the individual sources acting alone, or in other words, if we've got some distribution of, let's say, point charges, although we can generalize and turn sums into integrals, if we've got volume distributed charges, here is our field point where we're trying to calculate the field, and we've got a whole bunch of sort, source points. So let's say that's charge Q1, Q2, Q3, et cetera. And um, so we could say that this is maybe charge Q sub I right here. Then you would have um, R prime sub I, which is the field point, I mean, uh, the, uh, the source point for the ith charge. And then the position vector would be R, and remember that we always talk about this separation vector, which connects which points from the source point to the field point. And so this would be uh, the script R sub I, which connects the I field, uh, the, the I source point with the field point in question. There's one for each of the charges. And so the superposition principle is just that E at any given position is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times what you would get from Coulomb's law for uh, 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 the individual charges all added together. So the sum over I of Q sub I over script R I squared times R sub I hat. So you just add everything together in order to get the electric field of the whole charge distribution. And of course, the R is implicit on the right-hand side there. In other words, each of these script R's contains the position vector of the field point N because of the fact that each little script R is R minus Ri prime. And so even though we haven't explicitly put that on the right-hand side, it's there hiding. And um, if you had a volume distribution of charge, now in the real world, um, at least uh, as far as we know, string theory notwithstanding, elementary charges are in fact point like but if you're talking on macroscopic scales and you have enough charges around, it can be a good approximation to pretend that charge is distributed continuously as a fluid just like we can pretend that water, for example, is a continuous fluid, even though we know it's really made of individual molecules. So we often talk about a continuous charge density and imagine that it's well-defined at every point in space, even though we know that charge is really concentrated into little particles. And in that case, we could say, okay, here's some volume that has charge, and in that case, you would divide your little volume up into a bunch of little details uh, having charges 
dq. And so in this picture, there's the position vector of one of those little chunks into which we divided our volume. And then maybe the field point is right here. So that'll be the script R for that particular source point. And here is R, the position vector of the field point. And the principle of superposition for a continuous charge distribution is just that you integrate over the charge distribution. Instead of summing over discrete charges, you integrate over all the little infinitesimal charges, dq. And here's where we make the caution that you shouldn't get tempted to think of script r hat as a constant vector that can be pulled out of the interval, or of little script r squared as a constant vector that can be pulled out of the interval. They can't because you're integrating over the charge distribution, and as you do so, for each different point within the charge distribution, the script r and script r hat are changing. And so you're not allowed to pull those out of the interval. So that's that caution we always give in that regard.
then in that case, our dq is sigma of r prime times dA in that case. So uh, for whatever reason, lambda is typically used to represent charge per unit length. Sigma is represent to use charge per unit area. It's just uh, a dA prime because we're integrating over prime coordinates. Uh, sigma is uh, used to indicate charge per unit area, uh, despite what I have in the notes there, which says charge per unit length. Charge per unit area. And then, of course, the other possibility is that we might have charge distributed continuously over volume. In which case we write dq as rho of r prime and tau prime, where rho is the charge per unit volume. And this gives rise to loads of happiness and joy, because when you're using this to determine electric fields, you get to do really fun integrals. And I'm actually serious about that. I mean, when I took e and in college, um, one of the ways that I really learned, probably the way that I really learned how to not just do integrals, but to set up integrals, was doing exactly this. Uh, doing electromagnetic uh, problems where you had to integrate over charge or current distributions. Um, you know, so when you learn algebra, uh, everybody's able to solve algebraic equations before they can solve problems like a train is heading west from San Francisco at 60 miles per hour, you know, and another train heads east, blah, blah, blah. Of course, what, you know, what, what's the answer to if a train is heading west from San Francisco at 60 miles an hour? What does that follow? Yeah, the, the follow-up to that is jump out of the train that's about to go into the ocean. But um, now it's a big very column once. But, you know, word problems are always much harder for people to get good at and just doing algebra is calculus, same deal. You probably got good at taking derivatives and finding integrals before you, or even maybe it's still before you, got good at setting up differential equations or setting up integrals in order to calculate things. So there's lots of wonderful opportunities to set up integrals in order to do calculations that come from this expression right here, and let's do an example, shall we? Why, yes, we shall. So, we'll do example 2.1 from the book, in which our job is to find the electric field of distance c above the midpoint of a straight line segment of length 2L, which carries a uniform line charge. So we'll find E, the distance Z, above a line segment, length 2L, which carries a uniform line charge. So the picture would be that along the x-axis, we've got a segment which is charged. And so uh, it goes from minus L to L. Now we could do it from 0 to, uh, zero to 2L, or for that matter, from you know, minus L over 2 to uh, 3L over 2 or something deeply idiotic. But the natural thing to do here is since we're finding it above the midpoint, you might as well make everything symmetric and make the midpoint the origin. And so then along the x-axis, our line charge extends from minus L to plus L. And here we are along the z-axis, the distance z above it. And so this is our field point right here such that the distance to the 
line charge is Z. That's what's fixed in our integration here. We're doing this at a position Z above the axis. And because of the symmetry here, it makes sense to calculate the electric field due to pairs of segments that are equally spaced from the origin on either side. So I'll draw a couple of little line segments that are both supposed to be the same distance from the origin. Did I do that here? Yeah, just about. So we would say each of these guys has a little width dx. And so if I'm at point P and I want to find the electric field due to those segments, then of course the electric field is always going to be pointing directly away from the source if the source is positively charged, or directly towards the source if the source is negatively charged. That's the convention for electric fields. The electric field gives the direction of the force on a positive charge at that location, so therefore the electric field points away from positive charges and towards negative charges. So the electric field due to the little source on the uh, left of the origin points like that, diagonally to the right, vice versa for the little source on the other side. Well, how do the magnitudes of those two electric fields compare to one another? Completely different. That's completely wrong, Steph. How could you say such a silly thing? Chad, could you help us with that? Yeah, that's right. Duh, Chad. They're both the same. I know, yeah. You know, do you see what I have to put up with? It's, it's really, really tough. The word of the day is duh. All right. So, <laughs> you're glad you can help with that. Yes. So, uh, the, the electric fields are, of course, equal in magnitude there. Um, so, what do they add up to? In other words, you know, what's the net direction of the electric field? It's in the z direction, right? Because the x components are going to cancel one another because they're in opposite uh, x direction components there, equal and opposite x components. The z components will add together. So just by symmetry, without doing any calculation, you know that the electric field uh, along this line through the midpoint has to point in the z direction because if it leaned at all to the right, you'd say, well, how come it couldn't lean equally well to the left? And so, therefore, nature does the only possibility, which is split the difference. It has to be uh, straight up or straight down, depending on the charge, plus or, plus or minus. And there's no y component either. The y direction would be coming out of the board here, but same deal. There's no reason for the field to lean either in the plus or the minus y direction because of the symmetry. So very often, symmetry is your friend, and you have to exploit it. Here's a case where the symmetry tells us that we're only going to have the field along the z direction. So all we have to add up is all the little d e sub z's, the z components of the electric fields, uh, all of the little dx's of which our line segment is composed. We don't have to worry about any of the other components. So the differential contribution to the electric field from our pair of little dx's equidistantly spaced from the origin is going to be 2 because it's a pair. So in other words, what we'll do is we'll just integrate from 0 to L and multiply by 2, as opposed to integrating from minus L to L and not multiplying by 2. 2 times Coulomb's law says each one gives 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge, which is lambda dx. So we'll just say, since it's uniformly charged, that the charge density is lambda. So lambda dx will be the charge on a little length dx. If lambda is the charge per unit length, that if you're saying, well, how come you wrote it as a, with a primed over there? because I felt like it, because, you know, in other words, I don't have to call the integration variables anything in particular, so I'm not forced to put primes on them here, so I'm not, basically. Uh, lambda dx over distance to 
the uh, field point from the source point. Script R is what we use for that. So uh, divided by R squared. Uh, and then we need a cosine theta times z hat. And the reason for that is that if we call that angle right there theta, <coughs> then of course this angle is also theta. But the point is that that allows us to say that the z component is the magnitude of the electric field times the cosine of that angle theta right there. And so uh, magnitude of the electric field is dq, which is lambda dx over 4 pi epsilon r to r squared, and then times cosine theta to only have the z component. z hat says it's pointing in the z direction. And the 2 says there's a pair, so we're just going to integrate over half the line segment, double it in order to get the final answer. Okay? Any questions about that? Any, anything you're not quite on board with, would like to have clarified there? Or are we surrounded by happiness and joy? Is it cold in the observing process? Is it cold in the observing? Steph is trying to find out if I can be diverted by a random question. <laughs> Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, thank you for your concern. But I already had it going in. I think that whatever's going around in the dorms has visited me somehow. Because I got a lot of students saying, Dr. Harmon, I can't come to class if I'm sick. And apparently, there was a dedicated student who came to class anyway because they were sick and left her germ somewhere that I could find them. And find them I did. So, so. <laughs> right. Sorry, as I heard What's that? Don't come to class if you're sick, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, don't come to class and contaminate me. Come to class, but don't contaminate yeah. me. With this. <laughs> That's really what I'm saying here. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but there's a new diagram. That's totally true. See, that's that's true, what that's Oh, what a silly Dr. Harmon he is, yeah. That, of course, is 90 minus theta. Thank you for nay saying yes. That, of course, would be theta. By the way, the director can say that, too. She's allowed to point things. You've probably been sitting back there thinking that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK, well, you just say it, too. You can participate. Yeah. We'll be naysayers together. I don't, I don't want to just point out you know, things that are wrong. Absolutely should. That's why you know, hey, okay, really, you know, if I've got a mistake, pounce on it, seriously, because otherwise everyone's sitting there thinking, well, this is obvious, but otherwise, if you don't pounce on it, you're thinking like, am I just wrong? Why is nobody saying anything? Yes, would well, you like I to pounce? I just want to point out just how this chart, how chart is distribution. <laughs> there, let me fix it for you. How the charge is distributionalized. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does that fix it? The word of the day is now distribution. That's right. The word of the day has become distribution. <laughs> right there, 
is going to be such that the cosine of theta will just be uh, z divided by squiggly r or in other words equal to z over the square root of z squared plus x squared so z over z squared plus x squared to the one half power all right, thank you. Boy, I really am gone today. Yeah. I know, that's right. I'm just, yeah. That's because I was about to write that r was z squared plus x squared to the one half. Sure. And then I just jumped right into, you know, okay, right, whatever. Yep. Yeah, cosine theta would be z over r. All right, good night. Um, and so now that we've expressed cosine theta in terms of x, and remember z is fixed. Z isn't changing in this integral, so that will not complicate things for us. That says that the electric field, well, we can pull Z hat out of the integral, because that's certainly a constant, over 4 pi epsilon naught times the integral from 0 to L uh, to lambda Z over Z squared plus X squared to the 3 halves power dx. And so we can pull that z out of the integral because it's fixed in this integration. The field point is fixed. So we get 2 lambda z z hat over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then when we uh, integrate dx over z squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power, your handy dandy math tables, or more likely these days, your handy dandy Mathematica program tells you that the antiderivative of the <laughs> antiderivative of that expression is z squared times the square root of z squared plus x squared. So I have to evaluate that between zero and L in order to guess. When you're done with this, remind me that I have a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at what exactly 
how exactly does the BQ from over there translate into what we have in our first? Like step? over here? Yeah. yeah, this right here is DQ. Okay, in this just that. Mm -hmm. So what is the R vector over there? This guy, yeah. this is the this is just a generic position vector. So in other words, generically, if we have some curve in space that has charge distributed along it, then the little segments of it, we call them generically DL prime, and if I drew it right, we, we call them generically DL prime, and R prime is the position vector of that little arc, DL prime. Now, remember that whenever you do a definite integral, and this is a definite, no, it's gone now, but you know, when you integrate over a charge distribution, implicitly you're doing a definite integral. It has limits, it's over some region. You're not just finding it in any derivative, you're evaluating it. Um, the variable of integration is a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what you call the variable of integration. You can call it x or y or Q triple prime, or Bazimbo, you know, it doesn't matter what you call a variable of integration. And so here, I could just, you know, I could just as well call this the X prime axis and put a little primes on these guys. But there's no law that says I had to, so I didn't. That's all. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's all it comes down to is I can call my variable of integration anything I want. You know, my hand gets exhausted, right? Those primes all the time, so I didn't bother. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So you'll get plenty of opportunities to integrate over charge distributions to find their electric field, giving you much. What would it be, Corey? Sadness and despair. Sadness and despair. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, sadness and despair, and despondency. <laughs> right, yes. That would be in the parallel universe. In the real universe, you're going to get happiness and joy. All right, now we've reached an exciting juncture because we're going to study the thing that made Dr. Trees become a physics major. Do you know what that is? Gauss's law. That's right, yes. So that means, of course, we have to go. So, and you know, he's absolutely right about that. Gauss's law is so cool that I can well understand why that would be the inspiration for somebody to become a physics major. And because we love it so much, or at least we should, and because I want you to be the sort of enlightened physics majors who actually understand Gauss's law and where it comes from and not just know that it's there and it seems like magic and be able to use it, we will actually derive Gauss's law. First, we make sort of the make it plausible kind of argument. And then we go a step beyond and bring in solid angles and other things. So, Gauss's law. <clears throat> so let's start with looking at the flux through a sphere of radius r surrounding some point charge q. So there's q and no. Oh, I always follow that principle that I always forget. First, you draw the sphere or the circle, then you locate the center. All right, so there's Q, and there it is in some sphere of radius R, and consider some little patch on the surface. So you've got your area vector, which will be R hat times dA if we use spherical coordinates, R hat being uh, spherical coordinates with the charge located at the center. R hat is the unit vector which points directly away from the origin. So dA is R hat times the magnitude of the little patch of area there. And meanwhile, Q 
the electric field, of course, is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared times r hat. And so therefore, E dot dA is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared times dA. In other words, E dot dA is equal to E times dA, the magnitude of E times the magnitude of dA. And whenever I've got a surface such that the electric field is everywhere perpendicular to that surface and of the same magnitude on that surface, what's the flux? What's the general rule? If I've got a surface where the electric field has the same magnitude everywhere on that surface and is perpendicular to that surface everywhere, the flux is simply the, the electric field times the area. Yeah, electric field times area, right? If the, the electric field is everywhere perpendicular to the surface and of the same magnitude, then if I integrate E dot dA, since it's perpendicular to the surface, it's parallel to dA, and so therefore E dA cosine theta is just E dA, or minus E dA if there happen to be in opposite directions. So we're just integrating E dA, that's the, that's the result if E is perpendicular to the surface at every point, but if E has the same magnitude at every point, then it's a constant that can be pulled out of the integral. And when I add up the areas of all the patches, that's just the total area of the entire surface. So EA is the flux through any surface such that E is perpendicular to it at every point and of the same magnitude at every point on that surface. is just E times the area of the sphere, or in other words, Q over 4 pi epsilon r squared times the area of the sphere is 4, what's that? 4 pi r squared. 4 pi r squared. Hey, look, the 4 pi's cancel, the r squared's cancel, so you just get Q divided by epsilon naught independent of the radius of the sphere. So that's very suggestive. No matter what the radius of the sphere is, the flux through it is always Q over epsilon naught for a charge at the center. Now, Gauss's law goes above and beyond that and says, it doesn't matter where the charge is located in the sphere, you'd still get the same flux. And furthermore, doesn't matter that the surface is a sphere either. The surface could be any shape whatsoever, and the flux would still be Q over epsilon naught. So in other words, Gauss's law is the assertion that the flux through any closed surface is the charge enclosed over epsilon naught, because if it's true for one charge, the superposition principle says add up the fluxes for all the charges, and that's the total flux of the surface. And so since each charge contributes its own Q over epsilon naught, when you add all the charge together, you get the total charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. So that's what we want to prove, that the flux through any surface is Q, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. But we haven't demonstrated that. We've just made it plausible by saying, hey, it, looks, it works for spheres of any radius with a charge located at the center. To prove it, we've got to make a more sophisticated argument. And that's what we're going to do now. OK, 
Okay, any questions at this point? All right, then what we need to do is let's have, oh, always draw the circle first, then locate its center. Something to remember, you know, when, you, when you're giving talks and you're drawing circles, you're trying to locate their centers. It really does help. Anyway, so <clears throat> we've got our point charge Q, and we'll put some sphere that we'll call S1, surface 1, surrounding our point charge Q. And then we'll draw some other arbitrarily shaped surface, S2. also surrounding our point charge. And our goal is to show that the flux through S2 is the same as the flux through S1, no matter what the shape of S2 is, and then we will have succeeded in our goal of showing that it doesn't matter that the surface is spherical, doesn't matter that the charge is centered on it or not, because S2 has an arbitrary shape, and uh, Q does not have to be at its center. The way we're going to do that is we are going to Imagine drawing a cone from our point charge Q, which intersects surface S1 and intersects surface S2. And the idea will be that we'll show that the flux through the little piece of surface that the cone from Q intersects of S1 is the same as the flux of the little piece of surface that the cone intersects on S2. And if those two fluxes are the same, that'll mean that the total flux is the same through both surfaces because it'll mean that we can map any piece of S1 onto a corresponding piece of S2 that has the same flux. That mapping is one to one, in other words, every piece of S1 maps onto a unique piece of S2. So if I add up the fluxes through all the little pieces of S1, I'll, and I add up the fluxes through all the little pieces of S2 because they've been mapped one to one onto each other, and they have the same fluxes, that'll be true then that the flux through S2 is the same as the flux through S1. So here's our cone, and we'll make it a circular cone. It doesn't have to be. It could be an arbitrary shape. So it cuts out a little circle on S1. And so we'll say that that has area dA1 and that n hat 1 is the unit normal vector at that little uh, chunk of surface S1. And certainly the electric field at that surface S1 at that location points in the n hat direction if Q is positively charged, right? That's just saying again that the electric field points everywhere outwards from point Q, and so it's perpendicular to that sphere that is centered on Q. Okay, so is everybody happy with that so far? Yes? Are you joyful too? No. Sad. Attitude, attitude, attitude. All right. And then I'll draw a line through the center of the cone. So that's the axis of the cone there. And so we will consider then the unit outwards. Well, okay, so the electric field at location two on, on the surface of uh, on the surface too there, the electric field is also radially outwards at that point. So it's along the axis of the cone. But the unit normal to the surface in general will not be, because our second surface has some arbitrary shape. So the surface could be tipped in some arbitrary direction relative to the axis of the cone when we're out there at surface two. So this little patch of surface two, there's some angle theta between the outward normal and the 
electric field at that location. Theta is completely arbitrary because the shape of the surface is also arbitrary. And what we want to do next is find the fluxes through those little chunks of surface. And then we'll find that in the limit as they become differential, in other words, they become tiny, cute, little patches, in that limit they'll have exactly the same fluxes. It won't be quite true for a finite size patch, but as you let them shrink to zero area, the fluxes will be the same. So, um, The fluxes through the two patches are, we'll call DF1, the flux through the little patch of surface 1 there. DF1 will be E1 dot DA1, or in other words, will be E1 dot N1 hat DA1. And that'll just be E1 times DA1. Why is that E1 times DA1? Because it's what? No, 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 no Gauss's law here. We haven't done, we're proving Gauss's law, so we can't invoke Gauss's law. They're in the same direction, right? E and DA are in the same direction there. So E dot DA is just E times DA, in other words, for that little chunk of surface, okay? Meanwhile, for the little chunk of surface 2 there, DF2 is E2 dot DA2 equals E2 dot N2 hat DA2. So that'll be E2 DA2 cosine theta, because now there is an angle between E and DA, and so the dot product is the magnitudes multiplied by the cosine of that angle between them. So what we need, basically, is for DA2 cosine theta and DA1 to be related in such a way that when you take into account the different sizes of E1 and E2, the two fluxes turn out to be equal. And we will see that indeed that is the case, but we'll see it after we come back from break. After these first questions. Roll that people being put. Yes. And so I know you do. What we do next here is say, let's zoom in on our little patch two there. And so we'll think of, well, what if I drew at that location a sphere centered on Q whose radius was equal to the distance of our patch two from the origin there? So let's take a close up view of that. So this is a side view, so to speak. In other words, we're going to Imagine that we place our eyes in the plane of this patch, because I can't draw it very well with three dimensions, basically. Um, so this is a portion of a sphere centered on Q that um, is going to contain our little patch. So, Q is off there towards the, wherever the center of the sphere is. <clears throat> and so, I'll say that this little arc here is uh, a portion of that, well wait, okay, let me get this right here. So, This little line segment I'm drawing right here is supposed to be that, that second patch there, viewed from within the plane of the patch.
So this is this little line segment is DA2 sticking into and out of the page. And 
solid angle is the generalization of the concept of angle in the three dimensions. So here's a sphere. Here's a portion on the surface of the sphere, which has area A. And here's the radius of the sphere. So in other words, you know, think in three dimensions here. This is a sphere, and this cone is actually sticking out forwards a bit and intersecting a portion of the sphere over where my hand is above the blackboard here. And yeah, are we assuming that circular face of the cone to be convex, or are we assuming it to be small enough that we can? Right now, are you talking about the drawing I just drew? Yeah. Well, right now, it's of arbitrary size, so it is convex, as okay. a matter of fact. Yeah. But later we're going to be. Later we're going to shrink it down to zero size, but right now it's arbitrarily large, and so it is convex, yes. So we've got this circular cone, although the shape doesn't really matter. And the size of that cone intersects some convex area A on the surface of the sphere. And whoops, I don't mean to be that new omega. That's just plain omega there. It's not differential in size yet. OK, so omega there is the solid angle of that cone. And by definition, the solid angle is subtended uh, by a cone, the solid angle that a cone makes like that, is A divided by R squared. Or in other words, it's the area that it cuts out on the surface of the sphere divided by the square of the sphere's radius. And again, I drew it as a circle, but the cone could have any arbitrary shape. For example, we could also have a cone which cuts out something in the shape of, oh, let's say, a puppy <laughs> on the surface of the sphere. So cute. <laughs> oh, we are talking mega cute here. <laughs> so I will have a hard try time drawing this puppy-shaped cone. And yet, one could draw a puppy-shaped cone that would cut out a convex puppy shape on the surface of the sphere. And whatever the area of our puppy is, cut out on the surface of the sphere, then the solid angle subtended by that puppy shape is indeed the area of our puppy shape divided by the radius of the sphere squared. It doesn't matter, okay? So, <clears throat> if I want the solid angle for the whole sphere, well, that would be the area of the whole sphere divided by r squared. Or just 4 pi. <clears throat> and The unit of solid angle, and I kind of put it in quotes because uh, it has the same property that plane angle does. In other words, its units are really dimensionless because they're a ratio of like quantities. In other words, area has units of meters squared and r squared has units of meters squared, so it's really a dimensionless quantity, but we still give it the name. The unit of solid angle is the steradian. Steradian, steradian, as opposed to the radians of plane angle. And I don't know if Dr. Trees made this joke up or if he got it from somewhere else, but it's pretty good. He says, a solid angle is an angle on steroids. <laughs> Dr. Trees killed me. <laughs> Where does, he, where does he finish the, that the light started flickering? So I, I think. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that way. Yeah. I've been doing that since after. Yeah. Has been. In fact, you're, you're not even having to look at it, whereas I am. So. <laughs> Number three. Yeah, it's turning the third one. Yes. Yay. Excellent. Okay. 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 So 
there are four pi square radians in a sphere as opposed to how many radians in a circle? What's that?
<laughs> I really need to get it on. It's pointing at something. That is very like. I'm going to this. Okay. Well, anyway. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So we have successfully generalized the idea of plane angle between two lines to solid angle where you've got some arbitrary shaped cone and you want to talk about what is some sort of angle you could associate with that cone. The appropriate angle is the solid angle like we've defined it here. Okay, now why are we doing this you may wonder because the point then is that um, if I now draw a cone back to the center of the sphere where Q is located, then notice that the solid angle subtended by DA2 is the same as the solid angle that its projection subtends because its projection down onto the surface of the sphere is exactly what we do in order to define solid angle. In other words, to define the solid angle of the puppel, puppel, <laughs> of the puppy, <laughs> the solid angle of the puppy, we project it onto the surface of the sphere. To find the solid angle of the actual piece of surface, we would project it onto the surface of a sphere, which we could just take to be the sphere through that location, but it could just as well be any sphere centered on Q that projection gives me the solid angle. Uh, so, in other words, the solid angle subtended by patch two is dA2 cosine theta over R2 squared, where R2 is the distance of that patch from the origin. Okay, does that make sense? That's another thing that you know you need to be on board with that in order to understand what I'm saying here. So, 
Uh, just as I can project a puppy onto a sphere to get its solid angle, I can project any arbitrary patch of our surface S2 onto any sphere in order to get its solid angle. So here I've chosen to project it onto the sphere initially right through that point, just like I could, if I like, have the puppy on a big balloon, if you like, surrounding the point where we're trying to figure out what angle it's at And I just pr project the puppy onto that piece of surface that actually goes through our puppy here. Well, I've done that with this patch right here. And so it's, it's, uh, its area projected onto the surface of that sphere is dA2 cosine theta. And then I divide that by the radius of that sphere squared, and that's the solid angle. And so the solid angle of the patch is its projected area divided by r squared, in other words. The solid angle of patch dA2, as seen at the center of the sphere, as seen at Q, is its projected area uh, divided by the radius of the sphere squared. OK? Does that produce happiness and joy? Or does it produce, can you say that again? Yes? Yeah, how exactly do you need to project area onto cosine theta? To project area onto a sphere, what you do is, so, you know, suppose that there's some sphere surrounding you, OK? And I want to project, say, this paper onto that sphere. Then what you do is you draw a line from every point on the paper to the center of the sphere. And where those lines intersect the surface of the sphere, that defines the projection of it. So uh, take all the points on this piece of paper, draw lines to them to the center of the sphere. Where all those lines intersect the surface is the projection of that paper onto the surface of the sphere. That's the definition of it. OK, so in this case, I have drawn a sphere surrounding Q whose radius is equal to the distance of the second patch from Q. So in other words, it's just a, a sphere whose surface passes through the location of the center of this patch. <coughs> All right. This is so cool. It's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can continue, but so the idea is that um, because our patch is off at some arbitrary angle, um, you know, surface S2 here isn't a sphere, we take this patch, which is at some arbitrary angle, and project it onto that sphere which goes through its center. And again, that's done by just Take every point on that patch, draw a line in the center of the sphere, and where it intersects the spherical surface is the projection of that area, that patch onto the sphere. So, you know, if a sphere has very large radius, its surface is practically flat, right? Um, so consider this tabletop to be uh, a portion of a perfectly smooth spherical earth, if you will. And here's a piece of paper at an angle to the surface, okay? An angle theta in particular. The projected area of this piece of paper is its actual area times the cosine of that angle theta between the patch and the surface. Because here's the hypotenuse, so this is hypotenuse cosine theta. Hypotenuse cosine theta times the width in this direction gives the area of the projection. That's what I've done here. As long as, so you know, we're going to let these patches shrink to zero size. And so in that limit, as you let the patches shrink to zero size, then this sphere through here looks flatter and flatter. The smaller you make that patch, if you were a little ant looking at the patch, this becomes a flatter and flatter looking surface. And this tiny little surface then is just a, a little dish that's making an angle theta to that spherical surface, and so the area that it projects to on that surface is its area times the cosine of the angle between the dish and that spherical surface. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? So that, but like that wouldn't work, right, if you wanted to project it onto a smaller sphere? Um, it actually will, as long as you, see, the, the thing is, is that, um, as long as we're letting the patch shrink to zero size. So oh. if the patch has finite size, then these two lines are not actually parallel to one another, right? 
And so this isn't quite right because I treated this as being a right triangle here. I'm pretending that this is a right angle in making this argument. But it isn't really because this is a curved sphere. And so these lines are not really parallel to each other. And so this is an approximation. But as we let the patches become smaller and smaller, then the lines to the center of the sphere become more and more parallel. And it becomes a better and better approximation that these actually are right angles at those locations. So that it really is true that da2 cosine theta is the area projected onto the surface of the sphere. But that's why it's important that it's d a2, that it's a differential, a little tiny patch, because it's only in that limit that this becomes an exact result. It's the usual calculus, take the limit as blah, blah, blah. OK? So those are good questions. OK? Well, glad you asked them. Any other questions? OK. So the point, then, is that, all right, so this is d omega 2, the solid angle subtended by patch 2. But remember that the solid angle doesn't care which sphere you use to define it. So in other words, notice that the projection of da2 onto that very first sphere that we drew to produce da1 could also be used to define the solid angle subtended by patch da2. So in other words, let's see, if I found the solid angle of this patch, What would I write? Ignoring patch 2 for the moment here, <clears throat> what is the solid angle subtended by patch DA1 in terms of its area and in terms of R1, the radius of the sphere that it's sitting on? DA1 over R squared, right. DA1 over R1 squared would be its solid angle. But, Because patch 2, this tilted patch 2, projects onto patch 1, DA2 projects onto patch 1, then those two solid angles are equal to one another. solid angles are equal to one another. Because remember, you know, it doesn't matter which sphere I draw, any sphere I can take an area, project, take some object, project it onto that sphere, and the area that it projects onto divided by the radius of that sphere is the solid angle. And it's independent of the radius of the sphere because the projected area is proportional to the square of the radius of the sphere. If you double the radius of the sphere, the projected area becomes four times as big. So, uh, get my thread here. So if we go back and compare the fluxes again, <coughs> DF1, is E1 dA1, and um, <clears throat> so uh, how am I doing here? Why did I write that? It made sense at the time. So, oh, okay, just, just because I can't. Okay, E1 dA, yeah. So that's equal to R1 squared times E1 times dA1 over R1 squared. In other words, I just multiplied and divided by R1 squared because I can. 
first I was looking at it, I said, what do I do that for? Because I can, basically. You know, it certainly doesn't change anything to multiply and divide by r1 squared. And the reason I do that is because dA1 over r1 squared is the omega 1. So this is r1 squared times q over 4 pi epsilon naught r1 squared, that's e1, times the omega 1, the solid angles intended by patch 1. Or in other words, it's q over 4 pi epsilon naught times d omega 1. <clears throat> df2 is e2 dA2 cosine theta, remember because you've got that angle to deal with there, equals r2 squared e2 times dA2 cosine theta over r2 squared, I'm multiplying and dividing by r2 squared because I can equals r2 squared times q over 4 pi epsilon naught r2 squared, because Coulomb's law says that at distance r2 from the charge, the electric field in magnitude is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r2 squared. But dA2 cosine theta over r2 squared is d omega 2. solid angle subtended by patch dA2 as seen at Q. Because you project its area onto the sphere through that location and then divide by the radius of that sphere squared in order to get the solid angle that it subtends. Or in other words, it's equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught the omega 2. Integrate Q 
over 4 pi epsilon naught the omega 2. The solid angle is attended by all the patches into which I might subdivide surface 2. Q over 4 pi epsilon naught comes out of the integral. So I have to add up the solid angles of all of the little patches into which I would subdivide surface 2. So I can take surface 2, divide it up into a bunch of little patches of weirdo shapes because it's a weirdo looking surface. So if I put coordinates on it, it would be some weirdo curvilinear coordinate system on that surface. And if I <coughs> add up the solid angles of all of the patches on surface 2, which is a closed surface, as seen at its center, what do I get? You get 4 pi again. If you add up solid angle over an entire closed surface as seen from the inside, you have to get 4 pi no matter what. So in other words, ta-da, that's the ta-da moment, is that S2 had a completely arbitrary shape. And yet it was still true that the flux through any patch on surface S2 was proportional to its solid angle. Namely, it was Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times its solid angle in its intense. And since when I add up the solid angles of all the patches of closed surface seen from the inside, I'm looking at every possible direction. And since every possible direction adds up to 4 pi steradians, it doesn't matter what the shape of the surface is. The flux through it is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times the number of steradians in a sphere, or in other words, Q over epsilon naught. So not even worrying about d omega 1 being equal to d omega 2, you can just get this result that the flux is Q over epsilon naught through both surfaces. Or, if you like, you can also say, but we also noted here that d omega 1 was equal to d omega 2 because it's the same solid angle cone that's cutting both of them off. In other words, the solid angle subtended by our cockamamie patch 2 is the same as the solid angle subtended by our not so cockamamie patch pat the not so cockamamie patch 1 because the same solid angle cone was cutting off both patch 2 at its weirdo angle and patch 1, which was nice and on the surface of the sphere. The same solid angle here is involved because it's the same cone. So another way to view this result, you can integrate and say ta-da, or you can say every little patch on the spherical surface maps to a corresponding patch on the arbitrary surface surrounding it, which has the same solid angle. And since you can map the patches one by one, and for every case, the little contribution of the flux is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times the solid angle, then the fluxes have to be the same, because one by one, I can pairwise match patches that have the same flux through them. So when I add up the fluxes through all the patches, I'm going to get the same thing. So Whichever way you want to think of it as being easier to think of, take your choice. The point is that it doesn't matter in the end where the charge is uh, or that the surface is spherical because what matters when calculating the flux through any given patch on a piece of surface isn't how far the surface away it is. The little differential contribution to the flux is always Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times d omega independent of the size of the surface, how far away you are, whatever. Because the electric field goes like 1 over r squared, but the area of a patch given, subtending a given solid angle goes like r squared, and so the r squared is canceled. <clears throat> so I recommend going over this and being sure you understand it, because when you understand it, you've achieved an enlightenment that every physics major should achieve at some point. You know, it's best not to just think of Gauss's law as just this miracle that happens. You know, and then I know how to use it, but boy, it's just it's just weird. It's this black box to me because I know it works, but boy, well, this is why it works. Okay, so 
you, you achieve intellectual maturation when you can understand arguments like this. So it's good to understand an argument like this. And the other thing to note is that if the surface doesn't contain the charge, the charge lies outside the surface. Well, in a situation like that, I'm actually drawing that bigger than I want to, I want it to be more differentially looking than that. So here's my closed surface. Here's a charge sitting outside of it. Well, I draw myself a solid angle cone here. And the idea here is that in that case, you're going to get no net flux because, if you will, some of the patches are going to be facing Q, and so their DAs are going to be pointing kind of generally Q-word. They're going to be on the Q-word side of being perpendicular to Q. And on the other half of the surface, the far side of the surface, the side of the surface that's hidden from the view of Q, if it was a solid surface that you couldn't see through it, those patches have their DAs tipped anti-Q word, away from the side perpendicular to Q. And so what that means is you'll get cancellation of those fluxes, because again, the flux is proportional to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times the solid angle. But in this case, this will give a negative contribution to the flux from this patch, because here, E and DA will be having more than a right angle between them. There will be an obtuse angle between them, and so E dot DA will be negative. Whereas for patches on the far side, where E and DA have an acute angle between them, then you'll get positive contributions. And so every, pa every patch on the near side of the surface can be mapped to a patch on the far side of the surface, which has the same solid angle, and therefore the same magnitude of the flux, Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times the solid angle. But one patch will give a negative contribution, the other patch will give a positive contribution, and so they'll exactly cancel out. And so the net flux through a closed surface not containing a charge is zero because of that cancellation. If I put the charge inside the surface, that doesn't happen anymore because now you don't have that situation now you don't have where you can draw solid angles from Q that intersect the surface twice like that, such that they're going to cancel out. Now you could, you could make a funky surface like this where you can get situations like that happening. You know, like here is a patch, here's a place where you get a solid angle from Q intersecting more than one surface patch. But, you know, a little topology shows, probably a lot of topology, I don't know. But in other words, in such a case, you always intersect an odd number of times, so you'll get canceled, oh, but there's another one left over. So if you're inside the surface, you always intersect the surface an odd number of times with any solid angle cone. I don't know how to prove that, but any surface I can think of, it's true, you know, so that's my proof. I can't imagine it any different, so therefore it has to be true. Proof by, I'm so smart, I can't be wrong. Uh, not a very convincing proof to a mathematician, but uh, or to my lovely wife, for that matter, I'm sure, as she's shaking your head back there. Um, but if you're in, but so right, so, uh, uh, but if you're outside the surface, you go through an even number of times, and so you get cancellation instead of a net reinforcement like that. So that's why Gauss's law is it's the charge enclosed by the surface divided by epsilon naught. Um, the only thing that matters is the charge inside the surface. So in other words, if I have a charge of 22 quintillion coulombs right there, and that surface right there, the flux through it is zero. But if I move the charge to right there, the flux through that surface is 22 quintillion coulombs divided by epsilon naught. And anywhere the charge is inside the surface, same deal. Just get it outside the surface, and whoops, there it goes. It's gone. What if the charge is right on the surface? What happens then? 
typically it'll be half. Unless you're at like a corner point, you're absolutely right. <coughs> typically, the answer will be that it's half of that, that it will be Q over 2 epsilon naught, because as long as you're not at something which is pointy on the surface, no matter what your surface looks like, if you get close enough to that surface, it looks flat, right? And if you get close enough to the surface then, the idea would be your little point charge, if you think of the electric field lines, half of them go into the surface, half of them go out of the surface. And so the net flux will be half instead of the full Q, half the Q divided by epsilon naught. Now, if, you're, if you've got a Q, and you're at a corner of the Q, well, that's different. And I'll let you think about how that's different rather than just saying the answer to you in that case. But think about that. What do you think happens if you're at the corner of a cube? What happens if you're along an edge of the cube? Hmm. So keep thinking about that until next time. Because we'll just finish a minute early because I don't know what I'm going to do in the next minute. Other than any questions? This is a major stepping stone. <laughs>